So now that we've covered the basics of classical conditioning, you know what an unconditioned stimulus and unconditioned response, a conditioned stimulus and a conditioned response are, and you can identify those in examples. We're going to go on and learn more about some of the other principles of classical conditioning. Specifically, by the end of the video, you should be able to define and recognize examples of extinction, spontaneous recovery, higher order conditioning, stimulus generalization, and stimulus, stimulus discrimination. So for extinction, if you think about that condition response, that learned response, it may not last forever. So in some cases it may, and it just depends on um, a whole variety of circumstances that we don't really have time to talk about in here. But this is true for both operant and classical conditioning. So in classical conditioning, extinction is this weakening and eventual disappearance of the learned response. And with classical conditioning, it's going to occur if the conditioned stimulus is no longer paired with the unconditioned stimulus. So let's go back to our taste aversion example. So remember, you went out one night, you drank too much tequila, you got sick. So now the thought, the sight, the smell of tequila just makes you nauseous. But now let's say you go out with your friends and you're not drinking the tequila, they're drinking tequila, and you smell it, you see it, but you don't get sick. And this happens over time. Again, that condition stimulus, th the thought, the smell, the sight of tequila, is no longer paired with the nausea. So over time, maybe a year, maybe two, you go out and tequila shots sound good. Extinction has occurred. Now, we also talked about Little Albert, and there are a lot of stories out there about Little Albert, but one version says that he was adopted out before he, um, that learned fear, that fear of those fuzzy, right, fuzzy white objects could be extinguished. And then they found him when he was 30 years old, and he was still afraid of these furry white objects. Now, that would be an amazing example of the strength of classical conditioning, but it doesn't seem to be true. So no one really knows for sure um, because researchers maintain the integrity of confidentiality during the experiment. We also know the name is a pseudonym. It may have been his middle name, but it wasn't his first name, and there's no last name associated with him. So there are many stories out there. Um, one time I heard that they figured out who he was and that he had actually died at the age of five of some sort of encephalopathy. Um, the most promising story that I've read that I'll, I'll link some of this stuff onto the Canvas page is that there was a group of graduate students who looked back through the archives and wanted to narrow it down um, and figure out who little Albert really was. And so they narrowed it down to two infants. They were both sons of wet nurses at John Hopkins and they were the correct age. So I don't remember all the details, but basically they determined that one of the two was more likely for a variety of reasons. And um, when they tracked it down, they went to the family, he had already passed away, but nobody in the family had heard this story that he was actually little Albert. So I guess we'll never really know the true tale of little Albert at this point. Here's an example of an extinction curve. And so we're going back here to our example of Pavlov's dogs and the salivation that, that was learned to occur in response to just a food bowl. And here we're saying this is the presentation of the food bowl alone without the food. And so we see here at first, we have a whole bunch of saliva. That learned behavior is quickly weakened. We see it decreasing over time. And so it's the weakening and eventual disappearance we see here by trial number nine. So after nine times of that bowl being presented without the food, that behavior is extinguished. Now spontaneous recovery is the reappearance of a learned response after its apparent extinction. So let's go back to our food aversion ex uh, example. Again, remember you went out drinking, you had too much tequila, made you feel nauseous, but then after a while, a few months, a couple years, all of a sudden you can drink tequila again. Doesn't make you feel nauseous. But you go out one night and you see those tequila shots and you feel a little queasy. That would be spontaneous recovery. So you, you had extinguished that learned response it just reappeared. Higher order conditioning occurs when a neutral stimulus becomes a conditioned stimulus by being paired with an already existing conditioned stimulus. So hopefully you see the difference here. Instead of that neutral stimulus being paired with an unconditioned stimulus, it's being paired with a learned stimulus response pair, a conditioned stimulus response pair. And this you'll see happening around you a lot. You might see something, a, be a learned behavior and think, oh, that must be classical conditioning. But then you can't figure out where that reflexive stimulus response pair came around. And so that's because there was some higher order conditioning in there. So for example, Pavlov actually tested this out and this is how he came up with these principles. So the dog had learned to salivate in response to the food bowl. The food bowl was the conditioned stimulus, salivation was the conditioned response. Pavlov paired a light bulb or a sound or something else with that food bowl. So the light bulb was presented, then the food bowl, the dog salivated. The light bulb was presented, 
the food bowl, the dog salivated. Then over time, now the light bulb comes to elicit the salivation. The food bowl will also still elicit the salivation, but now you have two conditions that stimuli that elicit that salivation. Stimulus generalization occurs when a stimulus that resembles the condition stimulus elicits that learned response. So it's something that's that's not that condition stimulus, but it resembles it. Um, somehow it looks like it, it, it reminds you of it in some way, and it actually elicits that learned response. So let's go away from our tequila taste aversion example and move into something else. Let's say you go out to a restaurant and you had some undercooked pork. So that night you go home and you get sick. So the original condition stimulus here is going to be the pulled pork. But now not only does any type of pork, the thought, the sight, the smell of it make you sick, but chicken does too because chicken kind of resembles pork. And so now you're generalizing from the pork to the chicken. Stimulus discrimination, on the other hand, is the tendency to respond differently to two or more similar stimuli. So again, let's think about that, um, that pulled pork example. You went out, you had a pulled pork sandwich or some sort of pork, you got sick. So now the thought, the sight, the smell of pork makes you nauseous. So let's say you go out to breakfast and there's bacon on your plate. Well, the bacon is pork, but it's different than pulled pork. And so you're brain is able to tell the difference between the two stimuli and it doesn't respond to it with the condition response. So you can discriminate or differentiate between bacon, which is a pork product, and pulled pork. And so the bacon does not make you nauseous. So in classical conditioning, this is going to occur when a sim stimulus similar to the condition stimulus fails to evoke the condition response.